Children of Soul, Part 7 Hold position, the colonel said, taking a sip from her coffee. We got them running. How many did we take out? She set her mug down on a coaster and stood from her seat, looking out the ship's windscreen. A small smile curved up from the corner of her lips as she watched her handiwork. The enemy skyships had been reduced by a significant number, several of them crashing down to the ground. We took out 15 of them, five were able to escape. Did the scouts follow them all the way out? Give me a status report, this place looks worse for wear. Yes, ma'am. They're building a trench out by the bay, they took out the coast guard on the way here. Half of New London has been decimated by their earlier bomb raid, and ground troops are causing havoc. We may have come a bit too late. We didn't expect them to do such a bold attack. The news came too late too. New London isn't really the military capital either, the Strigs chose their target well. It still would have taken time even if we mobilized the moment they set foot on our shores. They took out mostly radio towers and steelwork factories. Some food factories were hit too. Hmm, Cameron hummed, pondering what the Strigoi might be up to. They mean to cripple us before the war starts. Gathering a fighting force would be more difficult now, especially with our factories in ruins. Still, we have reserves and a few more tricks on our sleeves. The Akiyas were a big surprise to them, and to think we just mass-produced them for military purposes a decade ago. The colonel sat down on her seat and let a deep sigh escape past her lips. She looked up at the ceiling humming a soft tune. Wayag, she suddenly yelled out in a breathy voice. None of the crew seemed to pay her any mind. They were used to the clown's random noises and tiny outbursts. It wasn't unusual for her to make random noises and unorthodox actions. She was quite eccentric, but a brilliant military strategist. Finishing top of her class as young as 18. A long silence followed with the colonel reaching out to the ceiling as if to grab something. She stretched her hand out and groaned, shaking her head. All right, here's what we do. She suddenly jumped out of her seat and nodded to herself. Orders, ma'am? We need to split the city in half. Excuse me, ma'am? Yeah, that's what we're doing, Cameron said with a confident smile. With all due respect, but why? We'd be essentially giving the city away. Not exactly, the colonel cleared her throat before taking another sip of her coffee. She set it down and placed her hands behind her back. The Strigs have already set down ground troops, and we're in the blind. We have no idea how many are down there causing havoc, and we know from the direction of their skyships that they're heading toward the Capitol building. Most likely to capture it, yes? The operator frowned a bit, confusion written all over his face. Um, yes? Precisely. So that means the majority of ground troops will be converging there as well. We're at a clear disadvantage right now. We definitely cannot retake the city in the middle of the night, this is their greatest strength. Furthermore, Strigoi are sneaky and slippery, they'll hide and use ambush tactics against our own ground units. We'd be sending them into unknown territory. However, if we deploy the Jotun. Yes. That would work. So why split the city? Don't you see? We'll lock them in. We let them get close to the capital, then make a line across the city splitting it in half. The majority of their forces will be stuck on one side, and the other half on the other side of the divide. We'll wipe out the bulk of them that way. This would also severely cripple the other side's ability to properly defend should we retake it in the following days. We'd also still keep half of the city. But ma'am, we'd allow the enemy to take hold of the other half, and would most likely give them enough time to build up their army and establish a proper foothold. The colonel clasped her hands and giggled. If the crew wasn't accustomed to her antics, they would have thought her insane. Perhaps they still did. She rarely acted normally around anyone, after all. 
that is, except in front of the generals or other high-ranking officers. Even still, the occasional slip-up would appear. That's the thing, Chester. Please just call me Airman, Ma. You see Chester, the colonel cut him off, waving her hand. That's what we want to happen. We want them to take the other half of New London. She grinned. W we do? That's right. Besides, we'll have the two most important parts of the city over on our side. The capital. And. The airman gave it some thought. There were definitely still some facilities near the capital that they could use and repurpose as factories. Perhaps some of the food shops it was the food shops around it, but it wouldn't be enough to support an army. There weren't any other strategic points that he could think of. You lost me, ma'am. Dante. We'll keep Dante with us. It's perfect. The airman's eyes went wide. He cleared his throat and began to protest when the colonel placed her hand in front of him, stopping him in his tracks. No, no. Give it some thought. With Dante on our side, we'll have the advantage when we launch a counterattack, she giggled, placing her hands on her hips. It's the perfect solution. If we play our cards right. Be but ma'am, we're at war with the Striggs. Why would the Duskwalkers fight their own kind? Let alone help us. Because, she smiled. They're Londoners too. That, T that gives us no guarantee. Oh, ye've little faith. There's a reason they've never fought against us. T they're biding their time? No, she chuckled. The airman looked down, his face scrunched up in an odd way. He let out a sigh and nodded. He faced back the radar monitor. The colonel could tell he wasn't convinced. She nodded and placed a hand on his shoulder and nonchalantly lay her chin on his head. I have a plan. Don't you trust me, airman? I do, ma'am. Then radio the mayor of Dante. Put him through the speakers. Chester sighed. Yes, ma'am. Calling up the mayor now. Patching it to the speakers. A faint buzz filled the room as they waited. A soft thing sounded. The airman handed the radio speaker to the colonel. Line is open. Colonel, he said with a nod. Thank you, Chester. The colonel smiled, taking the speaker from him. Hello. This is Colonel Cameron Thatcher, commander of the Solstice flagship. Please come in. Over. They waited for a full minute in silence. A small frown formed on Cameron's mouth. She cleared her throat. This is Colonel Thatcher, calling from the Solstice flagship. Please come in. Over. Silence followed once again. The colonel groaned and tried again. This is Colonel Cameron T.H. Colonel Thatcher, a voice from the speakers responded. Cameron's lips curved up into a wide smile. Finally, they were getting somewhere. This is Mayor William Hemmings. To what do I owe the pleasure? The voice continued. Mayor Hemmings. I have a proposition. Yes, I'm sure you do. I've been hearing about what's happening up there. My deepest condolences to those who lost their lives. It seems like things are getting bad. We Danonites could feel the city rumble above us. I can't imagine what horrors have been done. Well, I wouldn't go into detail. All I can say is that it's not exactly a quiet night. Well, I assume you're not calling to tell stories, Colonel. What do you want? Your help. A short silence followed. Cameron bit her lower lip. She already knew what the mayor would say. It wouldn't be all that surprising of a reply either. Considering the history of discrimination and silent hatred from Londoners. Still, the plan relied on the help of Dante. She had to try. No. I'm sorry, Colonel. I knew you'd say that. May I know why? Time to employ that silver tongue. She thought. 
the mayor cleared his throat and sighed. Dante is not obligated to help in any way. The Sovereign Neutrality Act states that should a conflict happen in Dante or New London, neither is required to offer aid. We were given control over our city as a sovereign body, despite still being part of New London, under the clause that we cannot interfere with your affairs. That goes for you too. You cannot ask anything of us unless it involves the safety of Londoners regarding Dante's actions. Yes, but Dante itself may be directly affected by this, especially if all of Anglestan goes to war. You would be dragged into it either way. If I remember correctly, there are also humans living in Dante, some of which have relatives here. Wouldn't that be a predicament? That may be true, but my priority is of my citizens here, and not of our cousins, brothers, or sisters that are somewhere else. Aside from that, we don't want the Crescent Moon to invade us too. I cannot risk it, I'm sorry. I hope you take the city back for yourselves, but come what may, Dante wants no part in it. The colonel walked around in a circle, keeping her eyes on the floor. William, she started. What would Amelia say? Soft murmurs were heard on the mayor's side. Excuse me, colonel? He said, surprise evident in the shock in his reply. I asked, Cameron said, her voice level and steady. What would Amelia say? Sir William Hemmings? Are you the son of the late Amelia Hemmings? A low growl emitted from the mayor's side. I don't know what you're trying to do, Colonel. But I advise you to keep her name out of your mouth. The Colonel's lips curved into a sly grin. But why? Is it a crime to invoke her name? The founder of Dante deserves recognition, does she not? I ask you, Mayor, what would she think? I don't know what she would think. She's been buried for eight decades. Yes, but I doubt you've forgotten what she was like. The great Amelia Hemmings, savior of the rejected. Founder of Dante. The Redemptor. The heart of all Duskwalkers. That's quite a title she has you know. I want you to be very careful with your next words, Colonel. I have nothing but admiration for her, Mayor. Don't get me wrong though all I know of her are from the history books. You knew her personally, and so I ask you what she would think. Do you know why Dante was founded, Mayor? Why it stands today? Don't try to lecture me on history, Colonel. I was there. A soft snarl escaping his words. Just humor me, Mayor, please. Mayor Hemmings took a deep breath, exhaling into a sigh. He took a pause to collect himself and remain civil. She wanted those Strigoi who fled the Crescent Moon, those who willingly surrendered themselves, and those citizens and innocent Strigoi who were caught in the war to have a safe place to live, he said. All without feeling alienated, threatened, or rejected. She gave us a place where we could be ourselves and live peacefully alongside humanity. That's right. It even included prisoners of war who sought to change their ways. Relatives of human families who were turned against their will. True-borns who felt they had no place in the world. Amelia Hemmings gave that. She lobbied the Angles government and fought tooth and nail to give your people rights, despite the still heated tensions after the War of Darkness. Why are you telling me this? What was she, William? Was she Strigoi? No. She was human. Why would she do that for the Strigoi? Knowing full and well the horrors they've committed during the war. Knowing just how different they were from humans. Why would she stick her neck out for bloodsuckers? History books gloss over this, saying she was a radical. But I think I know the reason. There was silence on the other end. Cameron cleared her throat and looked toward her crew all of which were silent as well, both interested and intrigued by the exchange. She allowed herself a small smile before crouching down and sitting on the floor. It's because you were turned, right? The colonel asked. 
I, the reply came almost immediately and stopped just as abruptly. A sigh emitted from the call, a soft rumble, and the creaking of an office chair. I was captured by the Crescent Moon during the war, just a few days before it ended, he started. They turned me, planned to use me as another pawn to fight for them. They knew no human would listen to a Strigoi's pleadings for peace or shelter on the battlefield, so most of those like me had no other options but to fight old allies. We were caught between being killed by the men we used to call our brothers, or silenced by our new masters. Cameron listened in silence, allowing the mayor to recall the events. When the war finally ended, and New London opened its doors to everyone, I went home. But, it was no longer the same as the one I lived in when I was human. Everyone hated me. Looked at me with disgust, fear, contempt, he cleared his throat. But when my mother saw me, she was overjoyed. She said, my son is alive. She was the only one willing to listen to my story, care for me, and see me as her son underneath the creature I had turned into. Empathy. If there was something that set humans apart from the crescent moon, it was that one trait. My mother, most especially, had plenty to spare. The mayor let out a soft chuckle. She not only listened to my story, but also countless other strigoi without fear. She became convinced that we were simply misunderstood and should be treated the same as anyone else. She wanted to build a safe haven for us. The rejected. The disgraced. And she succeeded. Yes. She fought for 20 years to found Dante. Up until her death. The approval was granted a day after she died, and I took over all the proceedings. All the groundwork. Construction. Laws. Economics. It transformed from a safe haven to a city. She never got to see what she had started, but her legacy lives with every single soul in Dante. Cameron smiled. She really is an amazing woman, she said. I wish I could have met her. Sadly, I was born almost 80 years too late. Though, I'm sure if she saw Dante now, and what you've done, she would have been very proud, I'm sure. You may as well have won me over already, Colonel. So we return to my question. What would Amelia Hemings think? A soft sigh emitted from the speakers, followed by a short silence. She'd be disappointed in me, he replied. She'd say damn all the neutrality and all your laws. There are people out there who need your help. If you could lift a hand to pull yourself up, why not offer to one who needs it, then lecture my ears off about changing the system? That sounds very much like her. Colonel Thatcher, what do you need of us? The colonel smiled, pushing herself off of the floor. She clasped her hands and whistled a long tune. Well, she said, I need you to extend Dante's purpose to some human refugees. Provide a safe haven, offer asylum, whatever. Protect our people. I got word from the higher-ups that West Minnie's border is closing in an hour to halt the ground forces advance. An hour is not enough time to evacuate even half of the city. And Dante is closer, I understand. Not just that, but you'll be our trump card. The Crescent Moon doesn't know Dante exists. They have no knowledge of any developments after the non-aggression pact. You have us join the fight too? Not exactly, the Angles army will be the brunt of the fighting force. I have other plans for your assistance, but I feel that a formal meeting with the President and his generals would be a better way to communicate it. But if you'd like to, you could spare anyone from your police forces, we're a little outmanned at the moment. We'll be deploying the Yoden Squad and Icarus Brigade. Our goal is to escort as many survivors as we can into Dante before we block off half of the city. Then we strike and completely obliterate the main force. You're using shock and awe. It only works once, Mayor. So might as well throw in something to make them lose their minds. I'm not sure about this. The Colonel smiled to herself and walked over to her seat. Don't worry, Mayor, she said, 
plopping herself on her chair. Humanity has more than a few tricks up its sleeve. We've been very, very busy lately. We just need time to properly prepare them. A patient hunter is a successful one. You'd be letting the enemy establish themselves though. With that time, they might as well have built their bases on the other half of the city. That's what I'm betting on. Let them bite before I reel it in. Hmm, Mayor Williams hummed in deep thought. You can count on us to take in the people, but I'll have to think about sending my own up there, Colonel. I'm sure you understand. Though, rest assured, any Londoner coming through our doors will be met with open arms, and well cared for. Thank you, Mayor. No, thank you, Colonel. The line was dropped and the call ended. The Colonel yawned and stretched her arms. Well, she exclaimed, we now have a failsafe and an ally on our side. Now it's our turn to show these leeches who they're messing with. Deploy the Jotun and get the Icarus Brigade ready to drop. The Strigoi are up for a big surprise. The officers and operators quickly went to work. They were going to deploy a few of humanity's newest toys. It was time to test just how effective they were on the battlefield. Though rescuing civilians would be the main priority, it wouldn't hurt to put on a little show. Icarus Brigade is ready, ma'am. And the Yoden? Five minutes before deployment, the operators are doing final checks. Good. Colonel! We have an incoming broadcast signal. Chester said, raising his hand. Cameron smiled and got up from her chair. Splendid! From who? She asked. It's, it's from the U.N. Navy. Well then, things just got a little more interesting. <laughs>